Good evening, everybody. If you would, take your Old Testaments and turn to Lamentations 2. Lamentations chapter 2. As we talked about this morning, Lamentations is a book that teaches God's people how to mourn. And so it is good for us to study it, even though we are Christians living in a different covenant from the covenant that they were living under here in ancient Judah, at the end of ancient Judah, before they're taken captive by the Babylonians and have to deal with the aftermath of that. And it's good for us to study this book like we talked about, because even though we are so far removed from the events of this ancient, weepy, Old Testament poetry, uh, we as Christians still mourn loss of different kinds in our lives today, even though We have promises in front of us of a resurrected body, of full adoption as sons, like Romans 8 talks about, and all the blessings of eternal life. But despite that, we hurt now sometimes in our lives. And so I am thankful that God does not gloss over our pain, that He does not sit on His heavenly throne and look down at the rest of us and say, what is your problem? Get it together. Here's a hanky. Dry your eyes. What you're dealing with in your life is not that big of a deal. The fact that this book exists in the 66 books of the Bible is evidence to the fact that God gives dignity to our suffering. That He takes it seriously. He doesn't pass over it in any kind of way. Um, He encourages us to come to Him with our tears and our frustrations. I don't know, because I'm not a part of this congregation anymore like I was a summer ago, many, many moons ago, Uh, but I don't know how many of you are coming into this room with frustrations and tears of your own kind. Uh, Maybe some of you have dealt with pretty serious physical problems recently. I could tell from some of the announcements this morning that there's been some hospitalizations and some things that people are dealing with. Maybe some of you are coming in with pretty fierce emotional things that you're dealing with, um, or financial things that you're dealing with. Maybe there's some kind of spiritual issue that you have, and you're in a battle with Satan. Maybe your sorrows are only known to you and your God. But whatever the reason, if you are weary, if you are sad, even if you are mad, Lamentations is the book for you. And not just for your own pain, It equips us to be able to serve the people around us in our congregations and our community who have pain. It gives us the perspective that we're not going to find anywhere else in the world. Because in the world, like we talked about this morning, there really is no great solution to sorrow and tragedy and hard times and afflictions. There's the kind of two responses that people in the world cycle through over and over for the rest of their lives after they've encountered something that hits them upside the head, either they deny the pain and they try to squash it down back into the box that way and they pretend like nothing's happening, or they get angry in response to it and and then try to deal with it that way. But in both of these situations, the pain is never processed fully. It never is dealt with and so it always remains. And obviously, even as Christians, we're going to have things about maybe our hearts or our bodies that hurt, but not to this degree, that even in this life, God can offer, especially through His Son Jesus, a kind of peace that you're not going to find if you go this route. Instead, what the Bible and what this book of the Bible entreats us to do is to go through a process of lament, of where we intentionally do things about our pain that take them to God, that we turn not just to the other people around us or to toys and trinkets and and Netflix and and become couch potatoes and try to drown our sorrows in, in, in something else or in somebody else besides God, but that we turn ourselves to Him. And then we tell Him about the situation. And we do it in detail. I mean, you notice through this book, we have acrostic poems. He is very thoroughly, intentionally laying out the entire situation, not just before his fellow uh, Israelites, but before God himself. 
So you complain to God about this, and then you ask him to do something about it, again, specifically, uh, make your request, and then regardless of what his answer is, you trust him in the outcome, whatever that outcome may be. Mark Vrogap says this in his book that I quoted earlier th this morning, tears are part of what it means to be human, but to lament is Christian. And so as we process hard things that we're going to go through in our lives, we're going to go back and forth between these, these various stages. And you see this, again, in these, each chapter that we look at. This is not a neat sequence uh, that you see in the text. But generally speaking, the poet is working through his pain so that he can more arrive at trust at the end of it than compared to when he started. So look for these stages together as we study this book. All right, so having said all that, let's look at chapter two together. In chapter one, the message that we, that we looked at in the text over and over is concentrating on how there is no human comfort for a lot of various reasons uh, for the tragedy that has just occurred to the people of God. And now in chapter two, there is a lot of focus on the anger of the Lord directed towards the sin of the people who are going through this mess and what it has produced for them. Eight different times in chapter 2, the idea is brought out of God's anger or His wrath or His fury or His indignation. All of those words are described in the English Standard Version that I am reading from and teaching from today. Um, and, and, and it looks at what happened because of that. God says, I destroyed you because of that. Verse 3, he says, he has withdrawn from them, his people, his right hand. Verse 8, he did not restrain his hand from destroying. So we're going to look at God's anger tonight, both its cause, its effect, but also our response to it and hopefully draw closer to God from looking at this. And so let's read chapter 2 together. You would please turn there in your Bibles if you haven't done so already. Verse 1 of chapter 2. How the Lord in His anger has set the daughter of Zion under a cloud. He has cast down from heaven to earth the splendor of Israel. He has not remembered His footstool in the day of His anger. The Lord has swallowed up Without mercy, all the habitations of Jacob. In his wrath, he has broken down the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He has brought down to the ground in dishonor the kingdom and its rulers. He's cut down in fierce anger all the might of Israel. He's withdrawn from them his right hand in the face of the enemy. He has burned like a flaming fire in Jacob, consuming all around. He's bent his bow like an enemy with his right hand set like a foe, and he has killed all who were delightful in our eyes. In the tent of the daughter of Zion, he's poured out his fury like fire. The Lord has become like an enemy. He swallowed up Israel. He swallowed up all of its palaces. He's laid in ruins at strongholds. He's multiplied in the daughter of Judah, mourning and lamentation. He has laid waste his booth like a garden, laid in ruins his meeting place. The Lord has made Zion forget festival and Sabbath, and in his fierce indignation has spurned king and priest. The Lord has scorned his altar, disowned his sanctuary. He's delivered into the hand of the enemy the walls of her palaces. They raised a clamor in the house of the Lord as on the day of festival. The Lord determined to lay in ruins the wall of the daughter of Zion. He stretched out the measuring line. He did not restrain his hand from destroying. He caused rampart and wall to lament. They languished together. Her gates have sunk into the ground. He has ruined and broken her bars. Her king and princes are among the nations. The law is no more, and her prophets find no vision from the Lord. The elders of the daughter of Zion sit on the ground in silence. They've thrown dust on their heads. They put on sackcloth. The young women of Jerusalem have bowed their heads to the ground. My eyes are spent with weeping. My stomach churns. My bile is poured out to the ground because of the destruction of the daughter of my people, because infants and babies faint in the streets of the city. 
They cry to their mothers, where is bread and wine? As they faint like a wounded man in the streets of the city, as their life is poured out on their mother's bosom. What can I say for you? To what compare you, O daughter of Jerusalem? What can I liken to you that I may comfort you, O virgin daughter of Zion? For your ruin is vast as the sea. Who can heal you? Your prophets have seen for you false and deceptive visions. They have not exposed your iniquity to restore your fortunes, but have seen for you oracles that are false and misleading. All who pass along the way clap their hands at you. They hiss and wag their heads at the daughter of Jerusalem. Is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty, the joy of all the earth? All your enemies rail against you. They hiss, they gnash their teeth. They cry, we have swallowed her. Ah, this is the day we longed for. Now we have it. We see it. The Lord has done what he purposed. He's carried out his word, which he commanded long ago. He has thrown down without pity. He has made the enemy rejoice over you and exalted the might of your foes. Their heart cried to the Lord, O wall of the daughter of Zion, let tears stream down like a torrent day and night. Give yourself no rest, your eyes no respite. Arise, cry out in the night at the beginning of the night watches. Pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. Lift your hands to Him for the lives of your children who faint for hunger at the head of every street. Look, O Lord, and see, with whom have you dealt thus? Should women eat the fruit of their womb, the children of their tender care? Should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? In the dust of the streets lie the young and the old. My young women and my young men have fallen by the sword. You've killed them in the day of your anger, slaughtering without pity. You summoned as if to a festival uh, day my terrors on every side. And on the day of the anger of the Lord, no one escaped or survived. Those whom I held and raised, my enemy destroyed. It's a difficult chapter to read, isn't it? And to some extent, we can say that about the whole book of Lamentations. Um, but this chapter, in the way that it deals with the anger of God, it makes us very uncomfortable, doesn't it? But this is a teaching of Scripture, and we are benefited from learning about it. And so I'd like to point out three central ideas from this chapter about the anger of the Lord. Again, its cause, its effect, and our response to it. So let's think about the cause for a second. And I want to center on verse 17 with you, where he says, again, the Lord has done what he purposed. He's carried out his word, which he commanded long ago. He's thrown down without pity. He's made the enemy rejoice over you, exalted the might of your foes. I think it's really important in a discussion like this of God's anger that we talk about the distinction between your anger and my anger and the anger of Almighty God because they're not the same thing so often. So often my anger, speaking for myself, comes from selfish motives. Somebody inconvenienced me. Somebody stepped on my toes. Somebody said something that I did not appreciate, and so I get angry, even wrathful about that. But God's anger is pure, and it comes solely from a a, a worry about uh, the sin and evil in the world and hatred of that in people's lives and what it does so destructively to other people. So often my anger is erratic. It comes and goes. It flares up quickly and leaves quickly, but God's anger is very deliberate and controlled despite what it seems like to the people who are at the receiving end of it. So often my anger is a first response, but God's is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That's what he says about himself 
in Exodus 34, and then shows it by not wiping out all of his people at Mount Sinai, but spares them and then leads them to the promised land. But even though his anger is slow and deliberate and pure, it will come with terrible force if he is ignored and ignored repeatedly. Again, notice what the prophet says, or the poet says in verse 17. You know, this, this, what happened to Jerusalem, it wasn't predicted uh, a week before the Babylonians came. <laughs> prophet after prophet was sent to the nation to warn them about the sin that they were doing and the consequences that were going to come on them if they did not carry out God's words. Um, and, and notice even this phrase in verse 17, which he commanded long ago. Um, there's a passage in Deuteronomy 28 that tells us about how if you go into the land and you ignore the law that is being given to you during this generation of Moses' day, Moses warns them right before he dies, you've got to pay attention to God when you get in there and you drive out the Canaanites. You do not worship their idols. You cling to my words and my commandments, and then you can be blessed. But other than that, if you dis dishonor me and disobey me, you're going to be scattered and destroyed among all the peoples. He gave them a lot of advance warning, even in those ancient times. Hundreds of years before Judah gets taken captive by Babylon. We appreciate advance warnings, don't we? Um, I mean, here in East Texas, we know what a good violent thunderstorm looks like, or at least we did before the drought, right? Um, as a kid living around here, I can remember seeing the massive wall of dark clouds on the horizon and knowing that, I mean, that sucker is coming right for us and we had better not go on that walk. <laughs> we had better take shelter in a car, in a house before that comes down the pike because it is coming. I think it's interesting and really helpful to think about when we, we talk about God's anger that every time, every time, a major judgment happens in Bible history, it is always given a lot of advanced warning. Think about Noah's flood. I mean, Noah is, is out there in the yard building this gigantic boat. Uh, I would think that the neighbors would know about that. Uh, and, the, and even the neighbor's neighbors would know about that. And I know that because Peter calls him a preacher of righteousness. He was... He was building the boat and he was talking to as many people as he could about the significance of what he was doing before the flood finally comes. Think about Sodom and Gomorrah. Who's living in the city before the angel finally comes in and drags Lot out? There is a righteous man who is there the whole time, even sitting in the gate, trying to, trying to curb this really wicked uh, society back to the Lord and His ways before God finally gives up. And there aren't ten righteous men in that city, and God finally brings destruction on them. Think about A.D. 70, when Rome destroyed Jerusalem. Late, much later on from this in Bible history, Jesus warned about that 40 years before Rome comes to destroy this place. And even before 586 in the Babylonians, all kinds of prophets, ending with Jeremiah, continually just beat their heads against the wall as God sends wave after wave of message after message to try to help these people understand how sinful they were and how much repentance they needed to offer and how they needed Him again. God is not a hothead. When we talk about His anger, His wrath, that point needs to be made abundantly clear. That He doesn't just fly off the handle and his short-term anger, because it is short-term, is poured out with a long-term healing purpose to it. So often I think that is overlooked. When, when I'm angry, I don't know about you, but I am not at all thinking about restoring or helping anybody else. I'm just thinking about myself. <laughs> I'm thinking about how I don't like what somebody else has done to me, and I'm thinking about possibly punching them twice for the one punch that I got from them. 
But God pours out his anger for very specific purposes so that he can rid people or nations of sin so that he can dump his blessings out on them later. He's got that in the vision, in the rearview mirror as he's making the, all these plans. This is a crucial point that God is not causing suffering because he needs catharsis. You know, he just needs to blow off some steam because we all get that way sometimes. That's not the nature of God, even though that might be our nature sometimes. Pouring out his anger is part of the process of blessing his people. Because once he takes sin out, now he can fully engage them again. And again, uh, we're talking about verse 17 and what God commanded long ago. What's after the horrific displays of curses that are going to come on the people that God warns about there if they don't obey the law? Well, Deuteronomy 30 then talks about the restoration and the blessings of what's going to happen after all that sin is, is removed from the people. You know, if you're a gardener, and I'm not, I, I'm, I sort of dabble in gardening. I'm not a very good gardener. Um, but if you're a gardener, what do you do? You attack specific weeds in your garden so that you can remove what is going to choke out the good stuff so that it can grow and produce a fruit. If you're a surgeon, what do you do? You slice open bodies. But you do that for the specific purpose of cutting out tumors, cancer, things in the body that should not be there, causing temporary pain for long-term good effects, right? That's what God does. Um, but he often does that in response to repetitive, unrepentant sin. That's what these people were in the midst of. That's why they're suffering. That's why they're in pain. Now, we need to be careful, I think, as we apply the message of this chapter. Some human suffering, like the suffering in this book, is the result of you've done something wrong. And so if that is your situation, personally, if you are suffering because of sin, then your repentance to Almighty God is called for, and you need to do that. But obviously, not all suffering is the direct result of something you've done wrong. And we can see many examples of that even in the Bible itself. I mean, you think about the man born blind in John 9. His disciples, Jesus and his disciples walk past this poor man sitting by the road. And they ask Jesus, who, who was the one who sinned here? Was it this man or was it somebody else that, that he would be born this way? And Jesus said, nobody sinned. in this. He's the way he is so that the glory of God can be shown. And it, they, it became clear what he meant by that right after that. Job is another example of a man who faced horrific suffering, not because he was wicked, but because he was righteous, unlike what his best friends seem to think about him. But regardless of the cause, times of pain are always opportunities for us to take stock of how we're doing in our spirits. Are we as close to God as we should be? Um, times of pain are often helpful for uncovering things about our hearts that we didn't even know were there. You know, it, it's, it's easy to think of yourself as a really kind and loving person until you get slapped in the face. And then you find out about maybe there are uh, there are aspects of my character that need to be a lot more forgiving that I thought were under control. But that, that moment has a way of bringing those things to the surface so that God can deal with them. So the, the cause of what they're suffering, the cause of God's wrath here, is this repetitive, unrepentant sin. And so the effect that is being produced by all this is overwhelming destruction of both places and people. You see this in verse 5, verse 11. Notice this. Um, the Lord has become like an enemy, verse 5. He swallowed up Israel. He swallowed up all its palaces. He's laid in ruins as strongholds. He's multiplied in the daughter of Judah, mourning and lamentation. 
Uh, Verse 11, he specifically focuses on the people. My eyes are spent with weeping, stomach is churning, bile is being poured out because of the destruction of the daughter of my people, the infants, the babies, the people like that. Isn't Isn't it amazing how quickly things can be dismantled? How quickly things that took a long time to construct and to produce then are eliminated in a matter of a very short time. Uh, my mom used to give this uh, illustration. She would talk about Thanksgiving dinner, and maybe you ladies who, who work very hard for your Thanksgiving dinners can relate to this, that it takes hours and sometimes even days to create the kind of spread that all of us would really like to have on a Thanksgiving day, but it takes a matter of minutes to gobble it all up. A lot of things in life are like that. It takes nine months to grow a human baby in the womb before it's born. It takes many, many years after that to to reach mature adulthood, but you can kill a man in a matter of seconds, can't you? A lot of Jews died during the destruction of the people during this time, 586 B.C. It took 13 years to build the temple, to build the palace that Solomon and, and Solomon's sons would live in in Judah. It took seven years to build the temple of the Lord, but it took a very short amount of time for Babylonian soldiers to march in and level both of those structures. And so as the poet looks at the buildings, he sees devastation. Verse 5. We read that. Verse 7, the Lord has scorned His altar. He's disowned His sanctuary. He's delivered into the hand of the enemy the walls of her palaces. Verse 9, the gates are talked about. They've sunk. They're ruined. The bars are broken. But it's not just the buildings. More importantly, it's the people who lived in those buildings, who worshipped in those buildings. Verse 9, the princes, the king, the prophets, are suffering. Verse 10, the elders sit on the ground in silence. The young women have bowed their heads. Verse 11, the youngest, most vulnerable people in their society, the infants, the babies, they faint. It's not just the guilty who suffer in a fractured world. It's also the innocent too. This is part of what we mean when we say things are not the way that they should be in the world that we live in now. Everywhere the writer turns, there is pain, there is suffering. Do you ever feel like that personally with your life, with the things going on with you? This writer certainly did. But what is the response? The response that he has recorded in the text is to, to tell us to cry out specifically to God about what is going on from the heart. You notice the overflow of emotions here. Verse 18, let tears stream down like a torrent day and night. Verse 19, pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. This day and night kind of language, I think really reminds us of passages in the New Testament where God talks through Jesus about how the people of God cry out day and night. Luke Luke chapter 18, verse 7. Will not God give justice to His elect who cried to Him day and night? Will He delay long over them? Uh, In the context of Luke 18, that's the unrighteous judge parable passage where Jesus is talking about how this, this woman who is a widow, she goes to this judge and she's pestering him all the time to try to give her the justice that she wants and needs. And this guy doesn't care a lick about her or about anybody else, but he says, in order to get her off my back, I'm going to bless her and give her what she wants. And the Lord sets that up as a comparison to say, if that's what the way people uh, operate like in society and in culture, how much more... Is your heavenly Father going to bless you? He cares about you infinitely. Way more than that unrighteous judge did for that woman. Will he not help you if you cry to him day and night? And did you notice how specific this writer is? He didn't just tell God, you know, I'm hurting about some things. He says, God, let me tell you about the mothers 
who are eating their children because they have no food left in the pantry, in the marketplace, in the field. There is nothing for us here. Do you see this, God? Sometimes when we're mourning, and this kind of goes to the denial cycle, sometimes we don't even want to name our pain. We don't want to even voice or even uh, describe with language what exactly it is that we are so upset about. And so when it comes to sins that we've committed, sometimes we'll pray to God and we'll just say, God, please forgive me of all my sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Without specifically telling him, Lord, I know that I said this and I did that. And I know how that makes you feel. And I know what that transgresses in your commandments. Please forgive me of that instance, of that specific sin that is a repeated issue for me. When it comes to tragedies that happen to us, sometimes we want to bury those events without much discussion. But part of dealing with spiritual PTSD is to tell God exactly what it is that you've experienced that has caused so much damage. Because regardless of your grief, God wants to hear about it. He wants to heal it. He wants to help you in his time. And so the proper response to God's anger is humility. Not to become angry with him, but to find out what it is that we can do to draw closer to him. And I think this is such an important point to to really focus on with this discussion. When we talk about the anger of God, we need to talk about this. That he does, we see him pouring out his wrath against sin, but we also see him rescuing his people from his own wrath. He's the one that fires the gun uh, at, at sin, but he's also the one that stands in front of the bullet before it hits us. Isn't it interesting? that at various points in this chapter, the poet says that God acted without mercy. Uh, Verse 2, verse 17, without pity. But clearly, clearly, the poet understands that the, the, the overriding nature of God is mercy and grace and love. Because, you notice verse 19, the very one who has caused This destruction is the one that he is telling his people to cry out to. Verse 19, the God who has poured out his anger is the God that you're supposed to pray to. Lift up your hands, he says there, for the lives of your children who are fainting dead in the streets. You call out to him for protection against what he is pouring out. That is amazing to me. And when we see the rest of the scriptures, we see that happening in the life of Jesus Christ. And that's why I think Romans 5 is such a great passage to bring into this. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. We sang this morning in the song, In Christ Alone, that on the cross, the wrath of God was satisfied. God was content to give up His own Son so that the demands of sin could be answered, so that, his, so that He wouldn't have to ignore or bury the, the fractured nature of this world, but that He could answer it in the death of His own Son. And so within the heart of God, we see a passionate hatred of sin. Clearly, as you read this chapter, but we also see abundant love to shield us from the effects, the full effects of his own wrath. So this innocent lamb that we read about much later in the Bible, who's offered for the sins of the world, Jesus is the answer to this chapter. We don't like to think about the wrath of God. It's kind of a scary concept to us, and it should be. We do not serve a God who is a milksop, who is this nimby-pamby person that the world likes to to think about when it comes to deity, 
a, a deity that can be put in our boxes and controlled into the ideas that we want to think of him as he is a God apart from all of that, apart from all of us. He hates sin. But he loves the people that he's made. And he sees us in sin. And he gave his son so that the parasite could die in all of us. May we never forget the terror that we all deserved because that's the only way to appreciate the mercy that we have all received in the death of Jesus. And so we're going to be led in an invitation song in just a moment. This is your opportunity to come to this God, to lift up your hands for the salvation of your soul, the life that He's given you, that you have squandered, that I've squandered, that we've all squandered. Um, but He offers us an escape from that, not based on anything that we have done that's good, and thank God for that because none of us can ever be good enough, but based upon what He has accomplished, what He has finished in the death of His Son. If we can help you come to Him for the first time, if we can help you come back to Him, please let us know. I will praise you with all of my love.